And the more technical people like Stanley Clark and uh, Mark Ian from Love 42. But they're all very good. I mean, there's so much, they're so good now, you can't pick one from the, you know, the, the, the standard's so high. You know, I mean, who can you say? To, I mean, I, I personally, I like McCartney's bass playing. Paul McCartney, he, do you? Yeah, he's good, isn't he? But you're talking about something a bit more advanced than... So you I like a bass player to play the bass instead of pretending he's a lead guitar player, you know, on the... Right. You agree with it? Yeah. yeah. So, I, I, you know, I've got no favourites, really. What about our wages, then? Do you, wanna, do, you know, do you know about our... Do you want to know about our wages? Well, each night, wasn't it? It was about... Uh, when was I was it? there all day. I mean, yeah. I, I sold Coca-Cola all day in, in the coffee bar right. and um, apple strudels and rum barbers and I could eat as many as I liked. <laughs> you try eating rum barbers all day. Yeah. <laughs> and down the bottom in the basement, where the basement was, there was a, um, there was a, 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 a Coke machine, wasn't there? That's right. Do you remember that? Yeah. There was a red sort of Coke machine with every, you know, and that lovely ice cold Coke you could just, uh, you know, get. And it was, it was great, wasn't it? Yeah. It was only a small place, really, downstairs, wasn't it? Downstairs was about four foot on top of this. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, that's about right, yeah. Anyway, wages. Can I take this off of here? Sure. Thank you. Hmm. So they're selling coke all day, and run barbers, of course. Then going down all evening, and we got 18 shillings. How's that? <laughs> Me and Adam Faith, he was down there, wasn't he? That's right. Terry yeah. Nellums. I'll never forget we were sitting in the gutter one day, me and Adam, and both skinned. So I said, Terry, I said, what are we going to do? He said, I don't know. He said, I'm starving. Anyway, someone came along and gave us half a crown each. And half a crown in those days, probably there's people that don't. Do you know what half a crown is? Oh. It's um, 12 and a half P, isn't it? Is that right? And that brought you a. a a mountain of spaghetti bolognese and he'd probably deny it now Adam but we got this half a crown each off of this person and we went and we hadn't eaten for about a week and ate this mound and that lasted us about another week you see carry on boy <laughs> <laughs> well as we're on the, on the matter of wages we uh, like you we starved a bit didn't we in them days starved didn't we just yeah. And uh, we often had to walk. Um, I had uh, digs in uh, Kensington, and we walked. There was three of us living in a room at that time, and we were uh, we were really living on bread and water. How about that? In That's those true. days, yeah. yeah. And although we was playing down the two eyes, but it saved our life really with the with the pound that we had. We used to go down Denman Street afterwards and That's have right. egg and chips. That's it. Okay. And uh, so, but that, that's how he was in those days. I, I, I just happened to recall, if I may just name drop, there was um, Johnny Kidd, remember him? Johnny Kidd, uh, when, uh, because he died, but, uh, but he, I, I was in such a, you know, uh, I was very, very hungry. And it was Johnny Kidd that bought me a meal. And that was very nice of him. He says, come on, Nick, you know, we'll, we'll take you into the cafe, just in St. Anne's Court there. That's right. And, uh, we, uh, and I did it to him likewise. And we were, you know, we, were, uh, we developed a sort of a friendship. Of course, then, um, then the tragic uh, news happened. He, uh, he mm. died, didn't he? Well, but, uh, but that's how it was. Uh, down the two eyes, uh, just, uh, just uh, 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 look at the one or two of the names that were down there at the time, because the flower was really blooming in those days. Wasn't that's it? right. Yeah. There was guys like, have you heard of Tony Sheridan? Yeah. 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 Right, well, he was down there. There was Brian Bennett. He was down there. Myself, Jet, uh, well, you kept, you kept come coming in uh, now and then. And uh, then there was uh, Brian Bennett, myself, and Tony Sheridan. And uh, we became, at that time, the Tony Sheridan Trio. And there was another uh, American uh, rock and roller who came, who came down there, and his name was... Vince. Vince Taylor. Do you remember Vince Taylor? Have you heard of Vince Taylor and the Playboys? Ever heard of that? 
he made a, a quite a good we, we were we were real rockers in them in them days and we did all that all the tracks that we did first take and uh, they were uh, like brand new Cadillac and all those uh, numbers I don't know whether you, you've heard of those but but they were blossoming at the time wasn't That's it right, the, yeah. the old boy and uh, the two eyes was really the center of where we where it was all, all really happening that's all right who else was yeah. there yes did you get the drum space from is that the famous bass yeah well i was working for uh wee willie harris at the time and the band leader was a man called tony crombie i was a i was a rocket then a tony crombie rocket i've been quite a few names i've been a page boy <laughs> Terry Dean Dean Ace. Yeah, that's right. Terry Dean and the Dean Ace. A Tony Crombie Rocket. A Drifter. And a few other. Don Lang. I was a frantic fiver, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, the famous bass. Yeah, well, I was playing string bass then, and uh, my band leader, he said to me, Have you seen that new invention? And I said, No, what is it? And he, he showed me it down Charing Cross Road in London, and there was this, I'd never seen one, a famous, you know, semi-acoustic type thing. And it was 40 quid. Well, I managed to scrape, that was quite a lot of money to get hold of then, you know, 40 quid, but I scraped it up. Oh, I think I sold me, um, me double bass, that's right. <coughs> and I got it in Charing Cross Road. And uh, I actually used to, get, it had a, the scratch ball was, um, brass or copper or something and I, if I touched the mic and this fingerboard, this scratch ball, I used to get a shock over this thing. Anyway, Tony Meehan put, put that to death. He, I'd lent it up against the dressing room door which opened inwards and it was there. So Tony, he must have seen it. He opened the door and let it fall inwards and it broke the neck off. So that was the end of that. So. I, I borrowed one then, a white one, I, I can't think what it was. But then of course, I, I joined Cliff and then uh, we started getting the famous Fenders then, you know. Don't think we paid, I think we got them for nothing, because we were advertising. But that's where the famous came from, Charing Cross Road. A shop called, tell a lie, Rupert Street. Oh yeah. Uh, a musical shop called Foots. Yeah, that's right, Foots. It yeah. was a bass player that's shop right. there. That's right, double bass player. I, I bought a bass in there, double bass. It's, it's called a Hawks Concert. And it was about seven foot tall, that's wasn't right. it, Brian? With a great scroll on top. And it was 105 years old. And it was a, a pound for every year I paid for it, 105 quid. And then that, that's how I managed to get the money to buy this bass guitar. That's it, that's my story. So, uh, in actual fact, your career, Jack, and mine, you know, although we went down the same two eyes, yet uh, you, uh, you went with uh, Cliff and Hank, you know, and Tony. Uh, 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 myself, uh, Brian Bennett and myself, we went in the, in the other direction. We played with, uh, on the old old boy show, we met uh, Marty Wilde. I said, Brian Bennett, myself, and a guy called Big Jim Sullivan. Yeah. Big Jim Sullivan and Tony Belcher, a lovely rhythm guitar player, we became the Wildcats then. That's right. Do you remember? So you were you were forging ahead with Cliff. No, no, I, 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 I was right. down there. I was with the Vipers. Vipers. I, that's that's right. right. And Cliff poached me off of Wally White and he poached me on tour. I was touring with the Most Brothers. I don't suppose any of you ever saw them, did you? That was Mickey Most and uh, you did. Age. <laughs> Wow. And it was a time, and I'd never seen anybody in a pink jacket and pink socks, you know, and a pink tie. And Cliff came up to me and he said, are you Jet Harris? I said, yes. He said, would you like to work for me? I, I'm going out on tour. And I said, no, I've got a job with Mickey Most. I was getting four and a half quid a night. That's right, with Mickey Most. And Anyway, we were doing this three-week tour and I suddenly saw Move It creeping into the charts, you know. And he's still offering me a job and it went up to number sort of 19 to 10. And I thought to myself, well, you better get in here, Jet. <laughs> so I said, yeah, I'll work for you, you know. And of course, 
Well, that's why I'm sitting here. <laughs> but I'd never seen this pink jacket and pink socks and this, you know. What about me hair? Do you know about this blonde hair I used to have? Well, when I was with the Vipers, we, we all lived in the basement. We had two monkeys, and under my bed there was a, a skunk called Sam who'd been, he'd had his smell taken out. And in, in the fox, we had, in the fox, in the cellar we had a fox called Sandy. And um, one day we, 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 we were bored because we weren't working. What should we do? You know, what can we do? It was pouring rain. And we decided to dye my hair blonde, you see. Well, what I didn't know, that it was bleach. I thought I could go to the bathroom after and wash this out, you know. But it, you couldn't, well, you know, especially the women know, you can't wash bleach out. Anyway, we had to go and do a gig. This is when I was just about to join Cliff and girls started screaming at this blonde hair, you know, so we thought we're going to keep this. <laughs> and then, of course, we went up in the charts and that's when there, there wasn't a dark-haired bass player in England. <laughs> Everybody was blonde. So I'd had enough of that one day, I went back to my normal colour. <laughs> None of them could play anymore. <laughs> so that's me, with my blonde hair. What, what else? Any questions? Yes. Who took the credit for writing your friend? Did you or Hank? Because you wrote the baseline, didn't you? Well, no, it was, it was a joint effort. Uh, there's three names on there, isn't it? Uh, Marvin Welsh and Marvin Harris and Mian, I think, isn't it? Yeah, but you came round with the, um, the baseline first, and then Jeff, uh, Hank, um, Jeff Jones wrote the baseline first, and then Jack jammed in with you, and that's how it came about, yeah? Yeah, and I wrote the middle eight. I wrote that middle eight bit. But, you know, I was always trying to get Hank to play some jazz. <coughs> this is when Bruce used to go deaf. No. <laughs> we, you know, we, we couldn't quite explain to Bruce how in modern jazz, on rhythm guitar, you just do a, a downstroke, you know, with the, the bass player. And he, he couldn't suss that. He was going junker, 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 you know. But in the end, Bruce, Bruce he began to like uh, a little bit of jazz, you know. But that was a joint effort, the actual writing. It was me and Harris and uh, Marvin. Yeah. Was you living in Willesden, Jeff? I was living in Willesden... No, I left home at 15, 16, I think. And I, that's when I was living in a, a basement with the Vipers. Because I, I passed you in a, in a place called Baker's Passage, just down by Park Road. Baker's Passage, a little alley in Willesden. Yeah. And I was going up the road and you were coming down. Park Royal, I wonder what I was doing there. I used to, I, I used to make milk churns in Park Royal for, for, the, for United Dairy Supply, yeah, I was a welder. And you know, I wanted to be music and mum was saying no, you know, there's no future in that. And uh, but I persisted, you know, but I was, I was strict modern jazz. I, I, I've been known to say, you'll never catch me playing that bloody rock and roll, you know what I mean? But that's how it works. I found out there was no money in jazz, you know. As much as, well, we still like it now, me and Laurel Jones there, we, we play it quite often. And, uh, and you like it, don't you? What do you think is one of the highlights of your career? Yeah. The highlight, the, the biggest thing that's ever happened to me was, um, when I walked past the king's, king's head without going in. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 no. The biggest, and no one can top it, is when I walked out on that stage at Wembley Stadium. The hair, what's left, went up at the back there. You know, the, it was an incredible feeling walking out in front of, front of I don't know, what was it, 90, 100,000 people. I, in all the time I was with Cliff, we never played an audience. I don't think Cliff's played an audience that big. But that, that is, everywhere I went, there was a little girl followed me with a walkie-talkie. I, I got him. You know, they didn't leave me in case I ran away or something. But uh, I, just before I was going on, I said, oh, I've got to go to the toilet. So she's telling them in the control room, I've got him, but he wants the toilet. And the, 
well, follow him, go with him. <laughs> so she, she, she led me to the toilet and uh, stood outside, obviously, because I'm quite capable, you know. <laughs> and I went in there and did the business and came out. She said, I've got him again, he's, he's done it. <laughs> and I could hear them starting to announce and then she led me up this gangplank and, there, and Cliff was saying, there they are, I've got two shadows here you haven't seen for years. Jet Harris, Tony Meehan. And I walked out of this plank and there it was. Can, can you imagine? They were on the field and all, you know. And that's the highlight of my life. They gave you a big buzz. Yeah, and Cliff gave me a good drink after, you know. <laughs> Yes. How did you get on the uh, Fender 6? How did you get into that uh, side? Well, the, the uh, best of my mutual, the man with the golden arm. Someone else told me about it, you know, but no one would touch it. No, it's all low. Exactly. Um, and I packed it in. I had two hits with it, but I, I packed it in because people were saying to me, if they were sitting in special, uh, different parts of the audience, they couldn't hear it. But because now with the amplifiers now, I mean, we weren't mic'd up in those days. It was just your, your, your 30 watt, not 30, what they're called, AC? AC 30s. That's all we had then, you know, to pump this thing out. And I, I just packed it in and went on to um, a detuned, no, it wasn't a Jaguar. I cleared this up yesterday. Diamonds was done on a, a Gretsch. Detuned, one tone. And I hope Barry is listening to this because he swears that I did it on a six string bass and I didn't. Anyway, over to Liquis. Let's hear something about him. Any questions, if any? <laughs> Where is the name Liquis from? Ah. It's, uh, it, it's to do with, uh, it started in 1956 in a skiffle group we had in, uh, in Lincolnshire and we was mucking about with instruments yeah, and uh, uh, like one what had a trumpet, you know, trombone and I had a clarinet and they call them licorice sticks, don't they? So I don't know what we'll call you, we'll call you licorice and it's stuck ever since, okay. <laughs> And, uh, and on stage, they used to sort of uh, throw uh, Bassett's licorice all sorts. <laughs> and, uh, and I used to get packets of these, you know. And uh, but that's how that's how the name came about. There's nothing, you know. It just it just evolved that way, you know, from uh, you know mocking about with their uh, with a toy clarinet actually. And so in those early skiffle days, you know, we were looking for nicknames for each other. That's when I had the tea chest bass. Remember the tea chest bases? And uh, mine was a broom, uh, ordinary tea chest, post office string, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, uh, an ordinary broom, you know, upside down, and the string tied round the head. And you pull it backwards, you know, to get the notes. Great instrument, good note. But you, the trouble is, your fingers were all smashed to pieces. Okay. That's right. But, uh, but that's, that's how I got the name Licorice, and it's stood ever since. What about some of those blisters we used to get from the double bass? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, we are talking serious blisters yeah, here, right. you know, yeah, it's yeah, the yeah, length yeah. of the thing, finger. And you, you, you've got to pop them, haven't you? Yeah, with a, we, we sterilise a needle, you That's know, right. in, in a flame. Yeah. And then just broke the uh, blister and, you know, and just... By the way, when you used to see us uh, grinning, you know, we weren't grinning, we were grimacing. <laughs> wincing. Uh, with, uh, wincing with pain, you know, but grinning at the same time, you know, sticking it out until we, uh, you know, the, uh, well, the when, fingers came on. When I, when I burst my blisters, I used to sit with, um, watching television in vinegar. Aye. And then I found a better one, and that's um, solder in flux. <laughs> that, gave, that gave me a bit of jip when I put my finger in there, you know, but it did the trick, it hardened all these and made them really hard. We could, I bet we couldn't play a double bass now without... Oh, oh no, 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 it's, uh, you know, I've, I've tried it, you know. Yeah, I've, I uh, tried Funny enough, I get the, uh, uh, it's not only the, you know, the fingers are suspect now, but I get, uh, it's up the arm, you know, the muscles up the oh, arm yeah. seem to uh, seize up. That's right. Um, is it you that dropped one? We've both done this, <laughs> dropped it down the stairs. Oh yeah, yeah. 
can I tell you about this? It was, uh, it, uh, there was a guy, a bass player, called Vince Coos. Never heard, have you heard of him? No, <laughs> no, no, no. Anyway, I borrowed his, uh, I, uh, I normally had an amplifier, which was about seven foot high, this thing, homemade, with Marty Wilde, right? And was going on, we was going to do a recording, uh, and it, uh, on Phillips, then, with Marty. And so, he, uh, so I said to Vince, can I borrow your amplifier? He says, yeah, but the trouble is, it's in King's Cross, left luggage. He couldn't so, afford to get it out. <laughs> so, uh, so I had to go all the, because this is from King's Cross to Edgware Road, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I went all the way to King's Cross, and uh, I, I got it out of the, uh, the left luggage, and it was as heavy as lead, you know. And yeah. sort of uh, picking it up, tiptoeing. Yeah. <laughs> All the way, you know, from King's Cross, how you know how I carried it off off the ground onto the tube. Anyway, I finally managed. You know, when we got to Leicester Square, the longest escalator in the world on the Bakerloo line, I think That's it is. Right there. And uh, so it was rush hour as well, and so I sat down, you know, on this uh, wacky great big amplifier, and so I laid it down, you know, and I'm sat on it, going up the escalator. <laughs> Right, and we got to the top, by this time sweating, sweat, you know. Yeah. And I just got up to get it, but the, the heavy end was the other end. And oh. it went all the way down the escalator, with people jumping on the sides. Yeah. Really, you know, and they stopped the escalator and every all. Oh, and it smashed and there were speakers and valves and everything, and it was just a piece of hunk of firewood at the bottom, you know. So I picked it up and left it in the information desk. <laughs> Talking about amplifiers, I bought, this is famous, this amplifier, isn't it? Yeah. I bought one in the same shop as I got my big double basses, and it, they thought in those days, if you lined it with sand, this is true, it would work as a, a baffle ball. Right. So I bought this thing, it was, it was about a hundred pounds, I'll never forget. But it took three men to carry it, you see. Anyway, it's on that first LP with Cliff. The, first, the live one he did in Abbey Road. Well, there's a picture on the back, you can see this big thing. It was, it was maroon, nice, which you never forget. Anyway, I sold it to the Hunters. Dave Sampson and yeah, the Hunters. Yeah, yeah. Now this is 1959. In turn, the bass player sold it to Chaz and Dave, who've hung on to it for, it must have been 30 years still, but then it, it, it exploded. I don't know how they exploded, but it is now um, a rabbit hutch. <laughs> In Chaz and Dave, or one of the, their gardens, it's a rabbit hutch now. The famous amp is gone, it's bit in the dust, but it did its work, you know. Any more questions there? Jill, we've heard how Nick Chris got his name. Is that right? You've got your name because you're the fast runner. That's right. Book. It's not long after the jet was invented, actually, to be quite honest. <laughs> <laughs> what was that, 53 on it? Or something?